All right. Now it comes time for our mission. So uh, before we get into our mission, I'm going to do a quick history lesson. Um, and I think that'll give us some context. So in the beginning, right? So where did artificial intelligence come from? What's, what's, the, what's the origin of that term? So uh, the, the science of artificial intelligence or uh, sort of thinking machines has been a long, around for a long time. Probably think about, um, well, go back in time to the uh, fascination with automata um, and all sorts of fun things there. Um, but the, the term artificial intelligence really comes into use in the 50s, um, specifically around 1956 at the uh, Dartmouth Conference on Artificial Intelligence. Um, the selection of the name was, was basically sort of a, a, an attempt to try to avoid having to seed ground to some other folks who had come before and, and had their own names for, uh, for thinking machines and their own emphasis. Um, but the idea was basically a collection of scientists and mathematicians uh, got together in Dartmouth uh, during the summer of 1956. And uh, we're gonna sit around and think about how they could help machines think. Um, or um, more to the point, uh, let me just read to you from the proposal uh, asking for funding to sort of bring these folks together. It said, uh, an attempt will be made to find, find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. And so it was out of, uh, out of this endeavor uh, came the field of artificial intelligence. Now, out of uh, the, the birth of, of this field, two main camps um, sort of came to be. There were those who uh, wanted to take a symbolic approach and uh, those who wanted to take a connectionist approach. And let me explain just a little bit about what that means. Um, so when you think about AI, you probably actually, depending upon how you're approaching thinking about AI, you might first think about the symbolic approach. And that's the sort of a logic driven approach. The idea that there are symbols that represent meaning um, and that you can connect these symbols together using logic um, to, uh, to encode information into a machine and then have that machine reason um, through use of these rules. Um, this is very much in keeping with what we would see today as a rules-based system, um, a, a rules-based approach to, to AI um, and is uh, what underpins uh, simple expert systems. So like the things that you built um, over the last couple of weeks, so the, the DACA tool and the Introducer tool um, might be considered very simple examples of an expert system. Uh, you, the expert, have some knowledge about how the world works. You represent that knowledge in some formal uh, logical sense, which is to say, if this, then that. Um, and then that embodied uh, knowledge that you put into the computer can then be used to help solve problems and to help the computer uh, in some sense, uh, I don't wanna say reason, but come to some solution based upon um, the logic encoded in those rules. And that's the symbolic approach. And that pro approach actually uh, led the day uh, for decades after the creation of the field. But then something happened, right? So in the 80s, people became a little disillusioned with all of the hype and the excitement around artificial intelligence. Uh, people had been working on these problems for a long time, but we still didn't have uh, computers that could uh, read uh, handwritten text easily. We didn't have um, all the things that we thought we were going to have very quickly. And uh, this is what's termed as the AI winter. So basically money and interest in artificial intelligence sort of went away as it, it didn't live up to the hype. And uh, like I said, the symbolic approach had been the thing that ruled the day. The connectionist approach uh, was very different. Um, but it didn't really uh, start to catch on until the last couple of decades. Um, and that has been the falling of the AI winter, um, which is the term that's given to this, this lack of uh, uh, funding and interest in artificial intelligence. And the connectionist approach was very different because instead of saying, let's find some people who have some know the rules and have them encode the rules and feed them to our computer, uh, rather we had uh, people saying, let's take the world have the computers look at the world and infer the rules from the world. Now, the way that they did this um, was based upon using some things that were, were modeled upon, um, very loosely modeled upon the operation of neurons in the brain. Now, you say that and it, it sounds more fancy than it is. And we'll, we'll talk more about these things uh, later on. But basically, they're you know, like little mathematical functions. You put numbers in and <laughs> numbers come out. And if you connect a bunch of them together, 
um, you can begin to make statistical um, statements about the world. And in that way, you can sort of uh, back into finding rules in the world by looking at a lot of examples in the world. Um, now, uh, this was not the approach that people took immediately uh, after the founding of the field. And it was actually not an approach that was really available to them until quite recently. So a uh, quick question about what changed. Well, the, the main things that changed were that uh, computer processing power just grew exponentially. So we no longer have computers that take up entire rooms. Um, this computer uh, and its functions would, would very easily um, be over, um, overpowered by your cell phone, right? So we all now walk around with supercomputers in our pockets. Um, and so the availability of cheap processing power means that the connectionist approach, which basically uses these little tiny mathematical functions sort of connected to each other, um, we can run all of those very quickly now, which is something that we couldn't do um, back at the, the dawn of, um, of the field. Um, but something else has changed too, right? And uh, that's big data, right? I, I, I really enjoyed making this slide. Anyhow, the idea is that there's now a lot of information about the world that is captured electronically and can be fed to our computers. So actually now we have an opportunity to take a bunch of data, feed it to our computers, and they actually have the power they need to go through it and find patterns. Um, and these two approaches, the symbolic approach and the connectionist approach, um, uh, underpin sort of two different approaches to AI. Um, and when we talk about AI today, most of the time we're talking about a connectionist approach, which is associated with uh, the field of machine learning, um, which is this sort of statistical approach of looking at data, finding patterns, and then using those patterns to help us understand what's going on. And we'll talk more about that um, in our, our next mission, but uh, we've got enough now to sort of get us uh, on the road. And what we're gonna do over these next two missions, um, our mission part one and part two, is we're gonna build uh, two AIs. We're going to build a symbolic AI in this mission, and then in the next mission, we're going to build a connectionist AI. Um, and then we're going to have them battle it out. I'm going to see which one was better, um, and so we're going to have to think about what we mean by better. Um, and we're also going to see which of yours were better. So that's right. It's a competition. The best bot. So uh, we're going to do a battle of the bots. Um, so your missions, what we're going to do is we're going to do mission part one uh, asynchronously. Mission part two, you'll start asynchronously, um, and then um, we'll, uh, you'll get most of that done, and then we'll evaluate them all together uh, synchronously when we meet on Monday. And then we'll have more discussion about how it is we think that one thing, uh, one approach might be better than another or useful in certain circumstances. And we'll have that whole discussion. But at the end of the day, I know what everyone here really cares about, is there's going to be a winner, right? So uh, you will uh, we'll see who wins and which approach wins. We'll see whether the connectionist approach wins or the symbolic approach wins, and uh, we'll see who among you will be able to create that best bot. And the winner will get this nice snazzy um, certificate. And um, and uh, I know that's you know now it's like well wait I mean I was going to do the missions anyway, but now there's a there's a certificate, so. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and actually, what I hope to do with these, the, this comp competition, as it were, is actually to have a lot of fun. Um, because what we want to do is we want to explore um, how these tools work. And the best way to do that is to play. So speaking of playing, uh, let's uh, go ahead and open your browser, head over to scratch.mit.edu. And when you get there, you're going to be introduced uh, to this wonderful tool called Scratch. Okay, I'll just wait a second so everyone catches up. All right, let me make sure I'm off the side, open the window. Great, you can always pause me if I, if I go too fast. Once you get to Scratch, um, uh, I'm already logged in, but you can click Join, and then you can create an account. It'll ask you for your email um, and the username. Uh, don't use your real name. Um, this is a, a, it's a, Scratch is an anonymous community, primarily of children learning to code. Um, I, but there are, don't worry, there are a lot of adults on here here too. And uh, in fact, actually, I went through a phase where I was just making, a, I was using Scratch to recreate um, old arcade games and had, had a lot of fun uh, doing that. And my son now, who's six, he, he loves it and he's doing all sorts of fun stuff. Um, I have to 
and then for things I'm glad he knew going into uh, going into our social distancing days, um, I guess it has meant that at least screen time has been productive. Um, but anyhow, the idea here is that Scratch is a uh, uh, a way to introduce people to coding. Now you've already been introduced to coding, so some of the things that Scratch could help you learn, you've already learned. Um, after you've gone ahead and created your account, though, come back to the main page. And I want you to go ahead and click on the Create button. And then what you'll do is you'll see the Scratch Editor. And uh, the Scratch Editor is going to have a couple different parts. Um, it takes a second here for it to load. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a, uh, a column that is going to provide you with options of the code you could use, um, a place to put that code, and then a preview of what that code is going to do. So that'll remind you of maybe the Q&A uh, markup editor. If you looked at Docker symbol last week, it'll remind you of the playground. Um, it's uh, similar to Community Lawyer, and it's uh, ability for you to play around with some stuff and then preview it. Um, the thing you're going to notice here, and you can sort of see it in symbols, right, is that the code is presented in Scratch as blocks. And really, it's like the idea is like building blocks. You take the building blocks and you put them together, and in that way, you can build a program. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to change uh, this display over here to make uh, our preview smaller, and that'll give us a little more room to work. Um, and what I want to do is let's be clear here. Uh, uh, here's the challenge. The challenge is you're going to build a bot um, that is going to take in someone's uh, statement of what their problem is. So the bot's going to say, hey, what's the problem? And the person's going to tell them their problem. And the bot's going to determine whether or not that problem has a housing matter in it. So it's an issue spotter. You're going to build a very simple issue spotter that's going to say, yes, that's a housing problem, or no, that's not a housing problem. Um, and we're going to do it using Scratch. Um, you'll see why, I think, more so in mission part two, as opposed to this one, uh, because there we're going to see that we can tie in some tools that are going to allow us to do the machine learning that we need to do. Um, and we will discuss exactly what that means when we get to mission two. Um, but for now, we're going to build a simple rules-based bot. So we're going to build an expert system, a very simple expert system, a symbolic AI that's going to say housing or not housing. Um, but we're going to do it with style. I keep thinking of Doc Brown and creating a, a, a time machine. You know, why do you do it in a DeLorean, Doc? Uh, well, you know, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, you might as well do it with style. Um, hopefully, my cultural references still resonate in some respect. We'll see. It's hard with the async. I don't know if we've got to land. Anyhow, we're going to go ahead and we're, we're basically creating a computer game, a video game. So that's kind of fun. So let me talk about what's going on here. So we've got We've got our potential bits of code. You can scroll through there, see a lot of different building blocks we could do. Um, and we can take those building blocks and we can drag them here and here. And then based upon what we put here, that's going to control the behavior of these items we see here. And what you'll see is uh, there are these things called sprites. And sprites are like little objects that we can control with our code. So right now I'm inside this sprite. So all this code applies to this sprite. And this sprite is our little cat. And um, actually, I went ahead and I just grabbed this thing that said, when is space, key pressed. And uh, why don't you go ahead and grab that too. It's in events and drag it into here. And then what happens is these events, these are little listeners. They listen for things to happen. And then after they happen, all the blocks attached below them are run. So this is very much like a function, um, kind of like a function in JavaScript, right? So we call the function in some way. In this case, we say when space bar is pressed and do all this other stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change that from when spacebar is pressed to when up arrow is pressed. And then I'm going to go over to motion. I'm going to find a little place there that says um, change y by 10. I'm going to attach that to the bottom there, just drag it over. And then what it's going to do is basically when the arrow, up arrow is pressed, the block below is going to execute. It's going to do something. And so any guesses about what's going to happen? Uh, that's right. If I press the up arrow, look. My cat goes up, all right? Well, my cat's stuck up there. If I push the down arrow, nothing happens. Oh, well, that, I can fix that, right? But if I take the same thing again, build another one, say, down arrow, and then again, go and I get change y by, but I change it from 10 to negative 10. Well, now if I hit the down arrow, my cat goes down. If I hit the up arrow, my cat goes up. Look, you're making a video game. How cool is that? 
I snuck making a video game into the middle of one of your law classes. That's all right. You're welcome. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we got up and down. Let's go ahead and do left and right. So we're just gonna do the same thing with the left and right arrows. So we'll say right arrow, left arrow, and we'll go ahead and grab. And remember, if I'm going too fast, um, you can um, you can pause me. Right now, I, I seem to be having a little connection problem. It normally tries to save this. I mean, it's, it's not saved right now, so I'm just going to to try again to save. So it'll catch back up. Um, so I'm going to take, instead of changing uh, Y, I'm going to change the X this time. So I'm going to do uh, change X left, negative 10, change X, and I'm just going to ignore that for right now. And I'll be able to catch up with it. So I'll get this little error message. Don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to change the X by either negative 10 or 10. And now I've got it. So if I use my keys, I can go left, I can go right, um, all those things there. Okay, I got rid of that little error message and uh, now we're back. All right, so I, I've got it now so that if I go uh, up or down or left or right, I can do that all with my arrow keys. So if we want to sort of see what this actually looks like, I can hit this expand button here and there's my game. And now I can, I can move my little cat around using my arrow keys. So how cool is that? You just made a little video game where you can move the cat around. It's not much of a game though, unless there's a, a goal or something going on. So what I'm gonna do is, let's, let's add another character here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna scroll down here and we're gonna click on this little cat icon and it says choose Sprite and we're gonna hit on the little uh, search icon. And then actually what I can do is I can look for a robot robot and uh, I click that and then we get a robot okay so now I've got this robot I've got this cat and what I want to do is I want to have this robot chase the cat um, and then when it gets the gets to the cat that's when we're going to have it ask its question and we'll have it do its, its job okay so we've got a robot um, I need some events to make the robot do something and so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna have this win green flag click. Whenever you start one of these programs, you actually have to click the green, green flags. That's like starting the program. And now we're gonna introduce our first new coding concept. Um, if we go down to um, control, you'll see we have these things like wait, repeat, forever. Oh, look, there are our friends if then, if then else. Um, so we've already talked about if statements. Um, another uh, important concept in, in programming is the idea of a loop, right? So this is, this is a forever loop, so I'm gonna take this. And what a loop does is it, it provides a way for you to take some bit of code and to have it be done again and again. You can make that a conditional loop. You can say loop through until something happens, or you can just say loop through forever. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do here. We have this, this forever loop and any bit of code I pull in, put in there, it will do it. Then when it's done, it'll do it again. Then when it's done, it'll do it again. Then when it's done, it'll do it again. So what I want to do is I want to have my robot go towards my cat. Okay? There's no reason why you'll know what any of the things in here are, but you can play around and you get some ideas. Um, but so I need I want it to go towards the cat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to motion. Let's see if I have anything in motion that's gonna be helpful. I want to notice this really helpful block. It says glide one second two, and then it says random position. Well, let's just see what that does. If I do that and I click the green, then we can see what happens is, well, the, the robot's just going to randomly move around. Okay, it's going to choose a random position and then take a second to get there. That's great, but that's not quite what I want. I want it to chase the sprite. If I look, actually, I can make it move not towards a random position, but towards a sprite. In this case, sprite one, which is our cat. So if I do that and I click the green arrow, then it's going to go towards our cat. And then I can move my cat with my keys. And then look, it's just going to follow us around, our little robot friend. Uh, there they go. There they go. Okay. And they'll just until they catch up with me. I think uh, it's a little too too eager, so I'm going to change that to three seconds, um, which means that I have a chance of sort of getting some distance before it heads off towards me. There we go. So now we've got this robot who's chasing me around. And yes, I have, I have um, 
intentionally constructed it so that you are now trying to outrun a robot lawyer. Um, I hope that's not too on the nose, um, but uh, that's part of you know, or what we're trying to do here, right? Is give you the skills you need, um, if not to be able to outrun a robot lawyer, um, to be able to work with it, um, or better yet, to be able to help uh, train it. Um, and so what we have here is we now have a robot that's gonna follow us. Um, I don't want it to always have to follow us, um, and I want it, when it catches up with us, to do something, which is to ask us a question. So uh, we're gonna need something that we, and so just to be clear, what's going on here is, it tries to glide towards us, and then that bit of code keeps getting done over and over and over again, which is why it can update uh, the direction it's going, and it will always come after us. So now I'm gonna go back into control. Uh, we're gonna get our friends uh, the if then else statement. I'm basically gonna take our glide there, put it in here. Now what this is saying is saying, if something is true, do that thing, otherwise head for for the cat, right? So uh, right now what's going on is it's behaving uh, pretty much like before because we haven't defined what that if then is. Um, so it can't be satisfied, so um, just following. Never satisfied. I will refrain from seeing how it works. All right, so we wanna say if something's happened. Um, and one of the things you'll start to notice in Scratch is they have different shapes for different things. So we need to find something that will fit in here. And actually here in this operators, we'll find that. And these will, this should look familiar to you from JavaScript, right? So we have an if statement, we have uh, evaluations, and here we have, uh, there are all sorts of evaluations. So we can put something in there. Um, but if I actually scroll up, I can find other things that have that same shape. And what they're gonna do is basically that shape is gonna have the ability to say either true or false, right? So this is saying, if something is true, then do this, otherwise do this. And so I have this nice sensing block, which is if touching, remember I'm, I'm inside the robot sprite, so it's saying if the robot's touching, uh, the mouse pointer then can do something, but I can change that, I can say sprite one. So if the robot's touching sprite one, I can do something. And the thing I wanna do is ask a question. So um, let's, let's see if there's a way to do that. Um, if I actually just look down a little bit, I see there's ask, what's your name, and wait. Well, that looks like asking a question. Let's see what that does. So I put that there. Oh, look, now it's asking me a question. If I go ahead and stop this, separate the two, hit the green arrow, I see that it will come to me, and then when it catches up with me, it'll say, what is your name? Well, that's not the question I want to ask. I want to ask, I'm sorry, that was probably pretty loud in the microphone. Uh, what is the problem? Okay, and what that will do is it'll ask what is the problem and then it'll wait. And then what it's, a, it's doing is it's taking these little ovals, that's a variable called answer. And it's gonna take the answer from what I type here and put it into that variable. Now, you see I, I entered something in, I answered and it just asked the question again because I'm still right there. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna be able to look at that question. So again, I'm gonna need an if statement. So I'm gonna say, if something in that statement, then do something, um, otherwise do something else. So I'm gonna take another if, I'm gonna put it there. And here I'm gonna go back to my operators that I saw before, and if I look down, I have this little thing that says, if some variable contains some other variable. And I know that the variable I want, here the answer, so I can say, if answer contains, let's say the word landlord, then, what I'd like you to do is, I'm gonna have this thing, there's these options here to say something and wait for a amount of time. And say, sounds like a housing issue. And then, otherwise I could say, And then what this is basically doing now is I've trained a really, really simple bot. So let me stop this, separate the two. I'll try to outrun it. Oh, 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 now I caught me. What is the problem, Nance? I can say my 
landlord. Say that and says, it sounds like a housing issue. I have a chance uh, to escape, but I didn't escape during that time. And then it asked me again. If I had uh, said, um, I'm cold, that's my issue. Uh, it's going to say, does not sound like a housing issue. And so what's going on here is now as I've, I've made a very simple bot uh, that will ask me a question, and then based just upon a keyword search, uh, whether or not the word landlord is present, will tell me something is or isn't a ha uh, housing issue. And uh, this is where it comes to be your challenge. You can use the operators and what you know about if statements, and you could make this so that you could have uh, and or actually probably or is better. I could take this thing, and you actually right click on stuff and you can duplicate them. So I can take this and duplicate it. And what I can then do is I can say if contains landlord, and let's make this a get a nice spot. If contains landlord or say rent. So now this would work such that if they ask me a question and say, Rent is too darn high. It's going to say, sounds like a housing issue. Right? So if I just type anything else, it's going to say, does not sound like a housing issue. Your job, your mission, is to take a few minutes and try to improve the spot so that it actually will be able to uh, distinguish between whether or not something is a housing issue. Um, so you, you might want to add more keywords here. So if uh, and you can play around with uh, with these conditionals however you'd like. So you can say if this and this, if this or this, um, and I want you to play around. You can play around with the rest of the characters as well if you want to uh, change your play around with your robot or whatnot. Um, just be sure to budget your time um, accordingly. I'm gonna I'm gonna put a, a a limit down in the text after I see how long all of the other um, components work, so I don't want you spending uh, too long on this. Um, but just take that time and uh, then uh, play around and improve your bot. And um, to give you an understanding of what's going to happen, is I have a bunch of questions, uh, lay people's legal questions, actually asking questions um, from our Reddit advice, which is a, a site where people will go and ask questions online. Um, they're all anonymous, and they've been provided to me as part of another project. Um, uh, that I'm working on that I'll tell you about later. Um, but that basically means they're going to be the things we're going to test against. So when we get together on Monday, I'm going to have a list of a whole bunch of real people's questions. And uh, we're going to feed them into your bots. We'll, we'll sit there, you'll bring your bot up, uh, we'll ask the questions, we'll feed them into your bots, and we'll see whether or not your bots recognize them as housing questions uh, based upon the rules you put together. And we'll see how well they do and we'll be able to compare how well your bot does to another bot by using its F1 score, um, which we talked about up above in the knowledge base. Um, and so if you missed that, you'll want to make sure you go catch that. Um, and so that's going to give us a way to evaluate how well your bot does against other people's bots. And then we're also going to compare those bots to the mission two bots that you build, which are going to take a, a connectionist approach. Um, instead of you creating these rules, um, we'll feed it some data and have the computer find some of those. Um, but really just take the time, uh, play around, um, and, and, and have some fun with Scratch. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, it's, it's a lot of fun. It can get addictive if you start to think of other things that you can do. Um, so uh, all sorts of fun games to play. Oh, and one more thing I almost forgot. When you're done, make sure that you save your project. So anytime you change something, uh, it should auto save, but save your project. And when you're done, in order to share it, uh, what you wanna do is you wanna go up and click the share button, and then it's gonna share it on your Scratch account. And you can give it a name, um, and you can give it some stuff there, and it's this URL here, and I'm gonna ask for uh, when I ask to turn it in. All right, so that's that, and I'll see you in mission two, and I'll see you on Monday. Good luck.